This is taken from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, and verses 21 and 22. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Here ends the reading of his holy word. So in our scripture for today, we find John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. Now, John has always been a very interesting person in the Bible. We love to tell children the stories of how he looked like a wild man and wore strange clothing. We love to tell them about how he ate locusts and wild honey. After all, these things are pretty interesting, and they keep the kids' attention, right? Uh, probably more than talking about the uh, Levitical uh, priest codes that are found in Leviticus, right? Um, kids would be much more interested in hearing about John the Baptist. But in this particular part of Scripture, we find John at a very pivotal point in his ministry. Indeed, I tend to look at this as the great temptation in the life of John. You see, the people that have been following him and listening to the message that he is giving to them begin to pose this question, and it is, is John the Christ? Is John the one that we have been waiting for? Is he the one that's going to lead Israel out of captivity? Now, those of us that know the rest of the story we almost scoff at this idea, right? Of course it's not John. Of course John is not the Christ. We know that it is Jesus that is Christ. However, put yourself in the shoes of the people that were following John at the time. John's birth was foretold by a visit from an angel. John was of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of priests for the Israelites. See, he had these certain markers about his life that almost matched the prophecy of the Messiah. He boldly proclaimed his message of the coming of the new age. And if you couple all of this with his wild and fearsome look and the fact that the people were expecting a leader that would lead a great army against the Romans, then you can begin to understand why people might have thought that John was the Messiah. Indeed, there are people that interpret the Bible that way to this day, believing that John was the Messiah. Now, as I said, I believe that this moment in John's life had to be a moment of great temptation. The people are beginning to believe that he is the Messiah. How easy would it have been for John to say, yep, you got me. I am the Messiah. Come and follow me. How easy would it have been for him to begin to believe the things that they were saying? I'll remind you, after all, John was a man capable of mistakes. I don't know about all of you, but I have known people that have changed because they began to believe the things that people said about them. I'm sure you've all run across this in your own lives. 
Now, most of you, if not all of you, know that I love being involved in coaching youth sports. I see it as an opportunity to spend time with, the, with my own children, serve the community, and hopefully have a positive impact on other children's lives. But one thing that I have noticed in my time coaching and indeed in my time uh, playing sports is the problem of overhyping kids. You see, we all know that person that was a good athlete when they were younger, and they were told that they're going to be the greatest of all time. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe that we should encourage kids to work hard and recognize them when they do well, but the problem becomes when we start to tell them how great they are over and over again, and they start to think that that's all it takes to be truly great. I've seen so many good athletes develop such large egos that they begin to believe that they are already the greatest of all time. And what happens to them is this, whenever they meet up with competition that is better than they are, because as I tell my kids in baseball, I don't care how good you are, there's someone else out there who's better. What happens to those kids is when they meet someone better than them, they often quit. Because it is impossible for them to believe that someone could be better than they are. After all, their entire life they've been told that they were the best thing there ever was. Now, in the worst case scenarios, what we see out of someone who experiences that is they come back home and then they live the rest of their lives remembering the good old days. They get stuck in the past of when they were great. I have a friend that I played soccer with in high school. And no matter how long it's been since I've seen him, whenever I get together with him, inevitably he begins to talk about how good he was whenever we used to play together. He will cite and say things to me like, you remember that time in uh, 2001 when we were playing Belfont and I made that amazing slide tackle to save the game? And I will humor him and say, yeah, sure, I remember that. I don't remember that. But he continues to live on those moments of the past because they feed into his ego. We see this as well, believe it or not, in the world of being a pastor. It's actually easier for a pastor, I think, sometimes when things are going badly in the church, believe it or not. It is easier for them because they can shoulder that burden. They know that it is part of what they have been called to. The danger for pastors is when things are going really well, when the church is growing, and people are coming to you and saying, it must be because of you. It must be because of what you're doing that things are getting better. It's very easy for a pastor to say, you know what, maybe it is because of me. But the truth is, it is not because of them. The truth is, is because God is growing that church. And so the danger is losing your humility in those moments. Now, I truly believe that this could have happened to John if he'd have listened to the people that are around him, telling him how great he is and how he must be the Messiah. But John, however, was not going to allow that to happen in his life. You see, he knew that he had a purpose. He knew what his purpose was in this world. He knew that it was to prepare the way for Jesus. He was going to be faithful to that calling. And he was going to even lay down his life in the end to fulfill what God had called him to do. See, John had two very important things that he understood. The first was humility. And the second was the need to serve. Because of his faithfulness, John is rewarded. He's given the opportunity to baptize Jesus. Now again, we could have seen John here puff out his chest and talk about his own importance. I, John, am the one that will baptize Christ. I'm the one who's been given the authority by God to carry out this important task. But that is not John's response. What does he respond when he is asked to baptize Jesus? It is not, look at me, I'm so great. Of course, God called upon me to baptize his son. No, this is his response going something like this between Jesus and John. Jesus says, John, I need you to baptize me. And John responds, who, me? You want me to baptize you? I'm not even worthy to touch your sandals. 
You know, the ones that you've been walking through, Lord knows what, on your way here? I'm not even worthy to touch those. No, I should not be baptizing you. Jesus, you should be baptizing me. See, even though John was given this important task of being the one that would prepare the way for Jesus, he never let that go to his head. Because of his humility, he was able to follow through on what God had planned for him. See, John was given a heart to serve. He was given a calling by God, and he was going to fulfill that calling to the very end. He realized that he had a purpose and that it was important, but it wasn't the same as what Jesus was going to do in this world. Now, the baptism of Jesus is one of those things that when we stop to think about it, we often wonder, why? Why would Jesus need to be baptized? Isn't baptism about the forgiveness of sin? Wasn't Jesus sinless? If so, then why the baptism? See, we often find ourselves getting stuck and confused on this because we want to equate the baptism of Jesus with our own baptism. Forgiveness of sins is part of why we baptize, but it is not why Jesus was baptized. So then what was the point? Why did he do it? Why was it so important that it took another prophet to prepare the way for him to be baptized? Well, it was important for a few reasons. First and foremost, it was important because it was what God wanted from Jesus. We see that in the response that is given to him after his baptism. In verse 22, God said, This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Secondly, it allows for a connection for the people of today. Baptism is a sacrament in the church that ties us to all those Christians that have come before us and indeed ties us to Christ himself. Last week, if you were here, you'll remember prior to communion, maybe you remember, I gave a little talk about how taking of the communion, it ties us to all those Christians that came before us and to our brothers and sisters around the world that are taking communion as well. Baptism also does this. How amazing is it that we share a tradition with millions of others that have lived and worshipped over the last 2,000 years? Not only that, but with our own Savior as well. Finally, the baptism of Jesus and the role that John plays in it shows that we are called to serve in this world. After his baptism and then his temptation in the wilderness, Jesus begins his ministry in earnest. He begins his life of serving others. We begin to see how he goes and changes the world. Doing so not as that conquering war hero that they had expected, but as the Prince of Peace. And doing so always with a spirit of humility. Now if we are to be like him, if we are to follow in his ways, then guess what? Our baptism is a call to service as well. A call to service with a heart of humility. So brothers and sisters, let us commit ourselves to those tasks. Let us renew our commitment to be in service in the name of the Lord. Not so that we can grow our own egos, but so that we can further his kingdom in this world. Amen. My challenge this week is this. Remember your baptism and what it means to follow Christ with a humble heart.